there. Um, the innovation that I'm going to be speaking about today uh, is specific to uh, structural steel connections. Um, and it, although it was generated out of a need specific to uh, a, a very challenging structural project, it's actually applicable to the construction of all structural steel buildings, and in, in particular to high-rise construction. Um, the, the concept itself is focused towards uh, simplification uh, of fabrication and design of structural steel connections. And really, as any building structure is only as good as its weakest link, this innovation, although it's focused towards connections, actually will improve the safety and economy of entire building structures. Um, as I said, this, uh, this technology was developed in response to some particular challenges on a project, and that project was 30 Hudson Yards uh, in New York City. Um, now, I won't go into great length uh, and, and detail about that, the specifics of that particular project, because I'm sure it will be the subject of future uh, awards uh, of, of its own. But I did want to start by acknowledging the entire project team. Now, the project itself, 30 Hudson Yards, is the tallest building in the Hudson Yards development in New York City, uh, rising some 1,260 or so feet. The development itself is the largest private real estate development in the history of the United States, um, and it features a variety of commercial, residential, uh, and cultural structures and amenities. It's, it's going to be an, an incredible addition to the city of New York. What's particularly interesting about the entire development, though, is that it is built entirely on top of an active rail yard. And of course, uh, for the structural engineers in the room, um, you can appreciate that this would re represent some pretty significant challenges uh, from a design perspective. Um, and in terms of, of landing a 1,260 foot tall structural steel sky rise on top of a, an active rail yard, you can appreciate just the magnitude of some of the challenges that would be represented there. Now, specific to those challenges, uh, landing this high-rise building atop of a rail yard means um, uh, you have to dodge the track locations and required clearances for the rail yard below. Um, that's going to require multi-story uh, transfers of the gravity and lateral load resisting system for the entire structure. Um, and in addition, there's uh, additional architectural constraints on member sizes, um, uh, which, which ultimately led to highly utilized solid structural steel columns and structural elements um, that were actually built up by laminating plates together to build solid structural steel sections. Just to give you a sense of scale and size and, and magnitude, you can see some, some folks there standing beside those, uh, those very heavily loaded solid steel columns and, and really appreciate the magnitude of the, of the structural feat uh, that is being addressed in this building. Now, as I said, the, the solid steel sections are actually built up from plates that would be welded together. And, and that actually creates particular challenges when you get down to the connections between the incoming structural elements and those, uh, those laminated column sections. So believe it or not, this is one of the more simple structural connections or nodal connections on the project. And I say that it's, it's one of the more simple connections because you'll notice that the, all of the structural elements are kind of a, all in a single plane. So all of the forces coming into that joint, they're all aligned in a single plane. And so we can build out the nodal connection where all of those elements frame together by stacking laminated plates together because plates work quite well in the direction uh, of, their, of their rolling, so in their flat direction. Now, what the challenge that is, is represented in construction like this, though, is when you have members framing in orthogonal to those plates, especially when those forces have to transfer through the laminations those forces want to tear the laminations apart. And so you're, you're challenged to try and pass forces through those connections. But to really understand the reason why, you, you kind of have to go into uh, having a better understanding of how we make st structural steel. So we often like to think of structural steel as, com as being this completely isotropic material. Structural engineers think of it as having the same yield strength in all directions, being fully isotropic, the same stiffness in all directions. But that's actually not true. The truth of the matter is that the mechanical properties and quality of any structural product, whether it's an I-beam or a plate section or a casting, are all driven by the manufacturing process itself. Um, so in the case of hot rolled plate, 
we actually start by a continuous casting process that is pouring liquid metal uh, and is freezing that liquid metal from the outside in. And we create slabs, which are then reheated and hot rolled into the plate sections. Now, what you have to understand is that um, uh, keeping in mind that structural steel or any steel attains its mechanical properties from a combination of its chemistry, the way the material solidifies and subsequently cools, as well as any post-processing working that's done to it, you have to then understand that what any structural steel element can do is a function of the way that it's made. So as structural steel slabs that, that are used to, to produce plate are solidifying from the outside in, on the outside we have a very fine grain structure. They're then hot rolled, but they're only hot rolled in one direction. They're kind of flattened out like a pancake. So that elongates the grains in, in really just two directions, not in three directions. And that works fairly well for thin plate, but when you get very thick plate, you have to appreciate that you're gonna have a difference in the grain structure all the way through that plate. And in particular, you're gonna have different strength of that material orthogonal to the rolling direction. So if I'm pulling a plate it, through its thickness, I don't have the same yield strength in that material. And, and connection designers understand this. Um, and in fact, you can see this quite plainly when you look at available material uh, uh, prop, uh, products and the strength of those materials. So here's a list of some standard uh, ASTM plate materials uh, that are commonly used in structures. Um, on this table, you can see uh, we have increasing thickness uh, from left to right, and we have the yield strength, which is an important design criteria uh, when, when, when structural designers are designing structural elements to resist forces. And so if I want a, a, a plate that's over eight inches thick, and as you saw in this structure, you probably want plates at least eight inches thick, uh, available materials will only tell you that you can, uh, you can get 32 KSI out of, that, out of that plate material. And when you're landing, say, ArcelorMetal high star sections that have 65 KSI against these plates, you're not able to transfer the forces because the members themselves are much stronger than the plates themselves. So if we reduce the thickness, we can get up to 36 KSI uh, between uh, maybe six uh, or four and a half to six inches, say. Um, and if we reduce even further, we can then get down to the 50 KSI, which more closely matches some of the, in the strength of the incoming structural members. Um, now, as I said, the, the, the manufacturing process also impacts the quality of these materials, so not just their strength. So in particular, as I said, in the, in the hot rolling production process, where continuous casting molten metal, it's solidifying from the outside in. If those, all of those parameters are not perfectly uh, uh, aligned and matched, there's the, the chance to form what we call dendritic shrinkage at the center line of that plate. And any connection designer will tell you that this is a very bad thing and it's uh, pretty difficult to address in terms of quality control. And, and so as a result, there's the potential when you load plate orthogonal to its thickness to actually form cracks at a, at a much lower load than you might have anticipated if you're just looking at the strength of that material. And so the result of, of all of this is that good high-rise connection designers using the, today's approaches for connection design and materials are gonna do something like this when you get to a multi-axis connection. So what you can see is they've turned the plate uh, that's going to align to the top flanges of all of those beams so we can pass the forces through, the tension forces through the top flange through that connection. Then they're gonna turn the plates back and build a solid steel web uh, with a number of members and welding it all together. And then we'll turn a plate again to catch the bottom flange of these incoming members. And all of this gymnastics is just to be able to transfer forces through these complex connections and to make use of the plate material as it ought to be used so that we're not having premature fractures uh, that are inherent to that manufacturing process. And here is, again, what I would consider actually a fairly simple connection uh, uh, that, that makes use of this approach. Um, you can appreciate all of the labor that has to go into building that, that sort of solid section in, in the middle. It's made up of plates just welded together. Uh, fabricators, steel fabricators are really, you know, they, they have a hammer and nails and that's all they know how to do. They buy plate and they weld it together. And so this is the approach that the industry has been using for quite some time. Now, as I said, this is a relatively simple connection, to be honest. Um, Hudson Yards uh, Tower A had some very, very complicated connections. And so here you see a multi-axis connection 
where you're not quite so lucky that the top flange and bottom flange of everything's going to line up. And you can start to see that this kind of approach maybe doesn't make sense from, from a design perspective. You're going to be laying welds on top of welds. You're, you're pouring in all sorts of labor to build something that really just wants to be a solid steel section. But again, we're, we're stuck using these manufacturing processes of the past. And so an alternative to this is to cast structural steel. And that's, that's what our company does at Cast Connects. We often design steel castings that can resist incredible forces and address incredible geometry. And so when the designers at Thornton Tomasetti approached us with this challenge, immediately we looked and said, well, no problem. We can cast a complex geometric form that addresses all of those incoming members, will have no welds, and will be free of any of these defects. And the reason that we are certain that it will be free of all of these defects is that when we design castings, we actually design them so that they will solidify from one end all the way up through to the other end without, um, uh, without the chance of forming centerline shrinkage. And so I think there's a, there should be a video there that should be playing. Um, but you can appreciate that we do this by using sacrificial uh, riser elements that will feed liquid metal down into the part as it's solidifying and cooling so that that solidification front propagates from one end to the other. Another step in our manufacturing process is to fully heat treat and stress relieve these components so they're fully isotropic. Um, there, there's no potential to have any of these residual stresses that, that can be built into complex fabricated connections. And we have very good certainty that we can be successful in this. We've put cast, you know, thousands of castings into use in hundreds of buildings all over uh, North America. And we've done very, very large connections. Here, for example, is a cast node um, that was designed for the Transbay Transit Center in San Francisco, which featured a five-foot solid steel section. And we know that those mechanical properties are achieved because we've destroyed castings of that size. We've sectioned them, and we know that we can get the mechanical properties all the way through the thickness. These are custom engineered and designed elements. Moreover, because we're casting, we can control the chemistry of that melt and ensure that even though we're making very enormous uh, uh, monolithic structural elements, that, this, that the end result is still weldable. Because, of course, when you're making steel, you can throw a lot of alloys at it to make it very strong, but that's going to impact its weldability. And we're still dealing with welding that has to occur either in the fabrication shop or in the field. And so when we're designing and selecting the materials for these custom design castings, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, that the fabricators and the users of them are going to be welding to them. So ultimately, we had a solution that would work very well for Hudson Yards. The challenge, though, was that this was one connection of hundreds, and all of them were geometrically different. And if you're making castings, that means you're making complex geometry, uh, and, and that requires complex shaped molds. And in order to make complex shaped molds, we have to make tooling. We use CNC cutting to produce our tooling, so we're going from computers directly to the real world. But unfortunately, every time we make new tooling, there's a cost involved, and we need new tooling to make every new geometry. And so although we had a technically feasible solution, we weren't sure that it was going to be economically feasible given the number of geometries in this particular project. So we looked towards a similar but different manufacturing process for Hudson Yards. We looked at the potential to use forgings. Now forgings are similar to castings because with forgings we pour molten metal into a mold and it, and it freezes. And the mold is carefully shaped so that we get solidification from one end to the bottom. But the next step in the forging process after it's been cast is to heat it up and actually crush the, the material from every direction. Um, and, and that's a form of hot working, similar to the plate, except we can do it in all three directions and get a more uh, uh, uniform and isotropic mechanical properties. Uh, unfortunately, though, with forgings is that you're limited to geometry because obviously you're going to be hammer forging these materials. You can't make nearly as complex geometry. Um, but moreover, when you're, when you're typically just going out to the market and buying forgings, um, it's very difficult to get any forging supplier to guarantee the mechanical properties of that material in the dead center. Now, we've been doing that for for 10 years with custom design castings because of all of the research and development that we've been doing. But forge shops will not. They'll cut a coupon out of the, end, the very end of the block that they'll sell you, and they'll pull it in one direction, the longitudinal direction of that block, and they'll say, OK, the, the material at the prolong will meet your 50 KSI yield strength criteria, but I'm not guaranteeing what's in the middle. And we weren't satisfied with that. We couldn't put that into service in Hudson Yards. And so what we did was we paired 
all of our expertise and understanding of custom castings with, with the forging manufacturing. We developed a proprietary cast steel grade and poured this cast steel grade into the flasks that are used to make ingots, and then we forged those ingots. We came up with a, a for forging pattern, a hammer forging pattern from all three directions to make sure that the end result was going to be isotropic. And ultimately, after all of that technology, a decade's worth of technology poured into solution, we make a very simple looking steel cube. All of that though, all of that technology is built into that material. We can make sections, solid steel sections, up to four feet by four feet in cross section, up to 50 feet in length that exhibit, say, up to 65 KSI in yield strength right through their very center. They are load direction agnostic. You can load that steel in any direction with no chance whatsoever of laminar tearing. This is a, 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 what should have been a very obvious solution but it's uh, completely innovative because we had to marry a variety of different manufacturing techniques to get to this point. And of course, no one's gonna take a manufacturer's word for it right off the bat. And so the, the, the fine folks at Related actually bought a full-scale block from us and cut it right in half and pulled tensile coupons uh, from that material in all directions, in all three directions, and proved to themselves, in fact, that we were right that we can actually achieve the mechanical properties that are isotropic in all three directions, including Sharpie notch toughness right through the cross section of this section. And so you take what would have been this very complicated connection, which had perhaps a, a questionable uh, uh, design approach where you're just laying down tons of weld and throwing tons of labor at it, and you simplify it just by putting a, a, a block in the middle, but it's, it's a high integrity block. And so this technology was, was used uh, quite a bit on this particular project and is now being used on uh, additional projects. Uh, this, this particular connection uh, features the block there, shown in red. And I want you to just appreciate how that poor little piece of material right there, for example, is being crushed and pulled by the weight of that building in all three directions simultaneously. And we have no concern whatsoever about the load carrying capacity of that material. You then go back to this connection that I said was actually a rather simple connection, but had a ton of labor, and you think, well, rather than putting all of those plates together and welding them together, why don't I just replace that with, with a block and save myself all of that labor? Now, in this particular case, you have a, a connection up here that might have had a small tensile force or, or maybe a compressive force, and so transferring that through these laminated plates wasn't an issue, but let's imagine that that force got larger. Well, no problem, we can just make the block larger. And so with, with this technology, you can appreciate that there's a lot of different ways that we can simplify fabrication, simplify construction, improve the resiliency of connections, and therefore in, improve the resiliency of the structures that we're designing and constructing, all the while making them less costly to do so, enabling us to build taller and safer buildings. Thank you. Thank you.